All right, welcome back. Now, her last name is one that holds weight beyond the boundaries of Kenya. For Charlene Ruto, being President William Ruto's daughter comes with some pretty heavy scrutiny. Well, she is, however, using the limelight to bring the public's attention to some serious issues like youth unemployment and climate action, to name a few. Well, she joins me in studio now for a candid conversation on what drives her in her charting her own path and, of course, what it's actually like being part of Kenya's first family. Welcome. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks for having me. You were actually abroad until yesterday. Yes. What was, was happening in the U.S.? Um, I attended the Powering Africa Summit yeah. that's run by a company called EnergyNet from the UK and they have a youth platform called the Youth Energy Summit. So mm -hmm. it was held last year in Nairobi. So this is a precursor to the one that's going to happen this year in Spain. Okay. So um, energy is actually one of the 30 things that the young people asked me to work on. It's not an area I'm an expert. I had to ask a lot of people to give me information. I had to do a lot of research, yeah. but it was a fulfilling two days. So tell me more about these 30 things. How did that all come about? Um, so uh, what happened, you know, I, I love the introduction that you've given. and. Uh, my father has been in politics for, I think, almost all my life. I'm 31 years old, and for 99% of it, um, he's been in, in the limelight. He's been in politics. Yeah. And so, quote unquote, I've also kind of been in the limelight. But it coincidentally happened that um, in 2022, after he won the presidency, that I also started getting very, very interested in our young people. And I think that is something that God really seriously put in my heart. Yeah. And to see how I can use the platform that I have to elevate our young people, amplify, accelerate their efforts. Yeah. So um, what my way of doing leadership is I don't believe in doing something alone. And my mom has always taught me that if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go with others. So that's how I reached out to the young people via my various social media platforms. And I asked them, I have a few ideas, but what are your ideas? What would you like me to champion for you? Mm. And that's how the 30 things came about. You know, it's interesting because um, you find yourself oftentimes, if you're a child of a high profile individual, in this dilemma of, yeah, the mantle of leadership should automatically come to me. But you find a lot of children of prominent individuals live a very quiet life. Mm -hmm. What kind of drove you to say, no, I'm, I'm going to use this platform for something? You're very right, Victoria. Um, I think most people in my position choose to live a quiet life. Maybe they work in the private sector or they run their own things in a very private way. But for me, I really must tell you, this is something I believe that God called me to because it's something that was stirring in my spirit and I was really getting very interested in matters youth. If you'd have told me two, three, four years ago that I'd be doing this, mm. I'd have been very upset because I was already in the private sector. I studied uh, communication and public relations at Desta University. I've done my MBA in hospitality. I've worked in the hospitality industry, in the IT industry. And I was fine. I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. But suddenly, things take a turn. And to be honest with you, it took a very exciting turn for me because working with the young people is so refreshing. Yeah. It's so refreshing. When I'm in a space with young people, my team always telling me, are you sure you're not tired? But any time I'm with young people, it refreshes me, it doesn't drain me. Yeah. You know, it was uh, International uh, Women's Day yesterday. How would you want to change the narrative of women and being one who holds the platform that you do? Mm. That's a very, very deep question. Um, I know we've had a few issues in the past around one or two months. I know there was the end femicide campaign, which I also gave a statement on my social media platforms about. And I know as women in Kenya, we were not happy about what was happening there. But in as much as we highlighted the negative, there's also the positive. And according to me, there's a living example of that. And looking at the story of Joyful Women Organization, which my mother runs, and seeing how she's impacted so many women through table banking for the past 20 plus years when I was at the celebrations last year and just seeing those women there from across the country saying, yes, this is my testimony. And 
not just there, but when I go to the ground to meet the young people and we gather the young people who've gone to our school, the mothers come and they themselves tell me, kwa sababu mama alitusaidia hapa. Like um, I was in Mombasa last year and I met some young PWD women that told me because of cross-stitch, um, they were able to pay their own school fees during the time of COVID. So there's that impact that already women have. So for me, I'm looking at how do we help then our younger women? I feel the women that have come before us have already set a good foundation. So how do we already build on that foundation that has been put for us? There are so many ways we can do that. We have platforms that our mothers, our grandmothers did not have. We're in spaces that our mothers and grandmothers were not. For example, the space you're in, in media, it's a space that if utilized so well, it can bring a lot of impact. So I think we do have a lot that we can still do, but we should be grateful also for what has been done. And speaking of a lot that still can be done, you do a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's talk about your organization. Is it SMACS? Yes, SMACS so what, Foundation. What does it um, do? Um, so reverting back to the 30 things, yeah. around 10 of the things that the young people asked me to work on were based on agriculture, agribusiness, agro-processing, climate action, that's climate mitigation, climate adaptation, beekeeping, which I personally take as an initiative. I'm a beekeeper by business. I run a beekeeping business. I have about a thousand beehives in different counties in this country and I use it as a case study to teach young people how they can also do business. So looking at all those things, um, we put together foundation which stands for smart mechanized agriculture and climate action for humanity and sustainability and we started off with a group of volunteers who are just interested from you know people I know and people applied for different things and now we have a team of very young amazing robust people maybe I think I'm the only, oldest person in the organization of about 20 of them who are doing some amazing things so what I really believe that we want to do through SMAX Foundation, I go also for a lot of global forums. Um, I go for a lot of regional forums. There's so much that we talk about in different um, summits. Yeah. And I know, Victoria, you also, you know, you, you moderate quite a number of panels and we talk so much. But for SMAX Foundation, we want to do so much. So we're setting up model farms and this World Water Day on 22nd of March, we'll be setting up one at Liter Primary School in El Geo Maracuete in partnership with the Ministry of Water. And we want to set up model farms in different schools so that we can start having the mindset from a young age that ukulima siyo ushamba. Yeah. We can get into the agriculture space, not just from production, but there are so many opportunities. I'm not tiring. Everywhere I go, I tell someone, I don't know an agricultural content creator. I wish there was somebody who had the idea, come to my farm, come see how I'm running my bees, go to see what Victoria is doing at her farm, go to see what Alex is doing in his farm, and combine for us this information. And actually, because of the level of information this is, you can actually sell it, and it be can become a way that you get a source of income. Yeah. So there's so many opportunities in the agricultural value chain, and what we do at SMACS Foundation is take it from a policy level all the way to the on-the-ground action so that we can have something for our younger people. I wonder when you actually sleep, Charlene, because <laughs> you you also are the blood ambassador as well. What got you into that advocacy work? Um, blood donation for me has been personal. Yeah. Um, you know, just, you know, someone sends you a text, my auntie's in hospital, she needs blood, could you donate blood, I do that. Um, so that has been happening in the past. Mm. And I've been coming more and more um, informed about blood and blood donation. So I met some two amazing young men who are running a foundation called Kenyan by Blood. And so they started giving me more information about this. So that is how, again, I met with the Ministry of Health and I met with the Kenya um, National Blood Transfusion Service. And they told me they want to onboard a few blood ambassadors. So we are four of us. There's me, there's Aisha Dafala, um, there's... Um, um, Caroline Wamangati, and we have one more gentleman from Nakuru. Yeah. So I'm so passionate about blood because blood actually saves lives. And um, Victoria, there's one story I'd just like to share um, on this platform you've given me tonight. Um, there's a doctor who reached out to me because um, I know many people, people even, I don't know where they get my number, but they just reach out to me and there's a baby who was in hospital and had gotten severe burns mm. and he needed, um, you know, when you get burns, the surgery is not elective, it has to happen immediately. Right. So um, he needed a negative blood and so the doctor reached out to me and told me we have this case and I acted immediately. I told the parastatal, well, this patient needs this blood because they're going for an emergency surgery and um, the patient was able to get the blood. Yeah. So the doctor just lightly tells me the surgery has gone well, the baby is recovering, would you like to come and visit him in hospital? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll come to, to hospital, but I didn't know it was going to break me. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the last time I cried, and it was that, 
So I can see it's getting you emotional <laughs> now. Yeah, when it was, it was it. that day. And I think, um, you know, as Kenyans, we, we, we talk a lot and sometimes we have a lot of negativity. But the point I want to prove about blood donation is that it actually saves lives. And the doctor told me if we didn't get the blood when we did, we'd have lost this baby. He's 11 months old. Yeah. And I just kept thinking we could have lost her life if I didn't act enough and in good time. So this is what we really need to do. I know Kenyans have a lot of questions about blood. And we're going to release a documentary very soon in partnership with the parastatal about the whole process. It's called Vein to Vein. Yeah. How does blood move from my vein? into your vein so that we are able to cover any um, negativity that may be around that. I know in the past there have been negative stories, but beyond that, I would like us to have a very good mindset that when we donate blood, we actually save lives. I want to go back to the moment you just had, which was a very raw and human moment mm -hmm. uh, that shows, yeah, she's real. I have to ask this because um, being in the limelight, being the daughter of not just any politician, being the daughter of the president, mm -hmm comes with a lot of scrutiny and criticism. And I wonder how you deal with it because oftentimes, you know, and let's be honest, when you're trending on social media, it's not always in a positive light. Yeah. How do you manage that? Um, <clears throat> that's a very good question to ask, uh, Victoria. And I want to take it back to 2022, or I think this was just before the elections. and. I think some people had started forming fake accounts with my name, trying to push a negative political perception. And I was enraged. I was so mad because they were posting about things I would never say, things I would never do. Yeah. And that is when I decided to own my own story. And I'd just like to tell everybody watching here, if you don't own your own story, then they will tell you the story. They will tell you your story. So when I decided to own my own story and started doing what I was doing, I think um, the first thing I was doing, I was, I, was, I was doing county visits. I was doing some tree. That's when I'd gotten interested in tree planting. And to be honest with you, Victoria, I. I had <laughs> I'd forgotten that my dad had become the president. He's been in politics for about 30 years. So it's like seeing one of your best friends grow yeah. from MP, you know, to becoming a minister, to becoming a deputy president, and to becoming a president. So it's like you kind of, you, you get used to it as you go along. So even when I was going to the counties, I was really just going as Charlene. I wanted to learn. I wanted to see what, how people are living, what they are doing. And the reception I would get was people, you know, there's all this security and people coming and everybody was asking, so what is Charlene going to do in the counties? And I'm seeing my, my face on the front page of the papers. I'm like, I'm also surprised because I'm like, is really what I'm doing of the greatest interest right. to our nation? Don't we have other better things to discuss? Right. And as well, it came with a lot of... Um, online uh, scrutiny about my dressing, about how I do my makeup, about my hair. I have a big forehead and I love my forehead. I mean, <laughs> I really love my forehead and I don't hide it. And even my, the people style my hair, I tell them, don't hide the forehead. It's there. I love it. God blessed mm -hmm. me with it. So um, I started getting all this online yeah. kind of negativity. And that's when I decided that cyber bullying should be one of the 30 things that I work on and that is something I'm slowly and surely working towards and encouraging our young people that with the space we are given, like I said earlier, when we get our space, we don't need to use it negatively. Yeah. Yet let's use it as a platform to encourage each other to um, to speak positively about each other. And I just want to give one example, because um, we have the Young People's Network International that we're just working on. It's an NGO. And we decided to use social media to talk about how we are launching a logo competition. And we're actually closing the last entries on the 11th on Monday. And I'd love for any young person who is a graphic designer. We actually said this one, we don't even if you can just draw. You have a paper and a pen and you can draw for us a logo. We have now already 1,400 entries just from doing social media posts. We didn't do anything else. And that's how we can positively use our space because this person who wins this competition is going to get some good money from it. Yeah. So I think if we can positively use spaces like that and encourage each other on those spaces, it would really be good, number one. Number two, I rarely read the comments. Mm. I don't go dig in there. If you go dig in there, you, will, you can get easily get discouraged. I do read my comments time to time to see what the young people are getting back to me with. But I take time not to read the comments because um, something I've learned with the time that my father has been in politics is everyone is entitled to their own opinion. And they look at him as a politician. I look at him as a father. And so being in my, in my space then is a bit tricky because I don't let what they 
tell me get to my heart because I know him in a different light. I know what I'm doing also in a different light. I know it comes from my heart. So it doesn't matter what people say because I know for sure this is something I love doing. You mentioned, you know, um, your father has been pub in public life for many years, mm. over three decades now. That's all you've known him as. Mm. For you and your siblings, because by virtue of being attached to him, any negative press mm -hmm. comes back to you as well. So how, when growing up, did you deal with that? Going to school, people know <laughs> you are from the Ruto family. Yes. How did you navigate that? Yeah, it, it hasn't been easy yeah. um, for me and my siblings. Um, we're a big family and I love each and every one of my siblings. And I'm the one who has chosen to do what I do yeah. publicly. And I respect that every one of us is following our own path. But each one of us has, you know, dealt with things differently. But I love that we share whenever um, there's an issue. So one thing I, I really must tell you is that we really take time to pray. And we have people who pray and cover us. And for us, prayer is very important. And I mean, the woman of prayer is in our very household. So that is something that we really take seriously in terms of dealing with the negativity that has come and the different issues that has come. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, when you know the person, when you know who it is, this is somebody who we see beyond the time that other people do. If he closes the office at eight, he's with us until the next time that um, he needs to go to the office, he needs to get back to work. So this is somebody who we know another side of them that other people do not. So I think that is how we have come to deal with it, by knowing the person and also by being prayerful about it. Let me take that question further. It's my final one to you of who is he? Because we only know him. <laughs> in public life, in the headlines, uh, when he's doing uh, an event somewhere or abroad. But who is your father to you? And what do you want to tell Kenyans? Um, my father is a great man. Um, I just want to say one thing. When we were growing up, he really gave us the leeway to be who we wanted to be. And that is how I can even be in this space today. Um, he didn't used to insist that you have to take this course, you have to do this. He would give guidance, but you don't say, okay, for me, I loved communication. So I wanted to study more of that. And my big sister is actually my career mentor. So she helped, she helped me and she, and then we went together to my dad and said, this is what she wants to do. Can you give us guidance? She's like, oh yeah, that, she's good at that. Let, yeah. let her do it. So he's a mentor. He's somebody who gives uh, a lot of guidance. Um, he's somebody who I must say is very passionate about this country and I've seen it from sitting in the back of the room. I can see the passion, the drive he has and it's not for anything just because I believe that's what he has been called to do. So I can say in a nutshell that is uh, who he is because bringing us up and it reflects across his character even back at home because yeah. that's what him being free with who he is and being true to who he is has also made me to be true to who I am in my work with the young people. So who's more strict, your mom or dad? Uh, my mom. <laughs> you can get away with a lot with dad, but mom, she's always there. She knows you in and out. She runs a tight ship, I can imagine. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Charlene Thank Ruto, you, speaking to us and sharing about her journey uh, and advocacy work and the change she wants to make in this country and beyond. Let's take a short break here on Citizen Weekend. Much more ahead, including...